listeners, and welcome to the latest episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I remain your host, Jason Johnston Yellen, known by many names, and my good friend, here he is, staring me square in the eyes after two weeks of me being away, not you being away, is Joshua Morrissey Hatton. Hello, Joshua. Hello, Jason. How you doing? Good. Good. You and I, in the annals of Extra Extra, that was annals of <laughs> Extra Extra, two ends. We bring a whiskey-related story to the attention of the other. We cover it in the first half of the episode. We riff on it in the second half and we get out of here in a tight 30 to 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. in, in recent history, it's been a tight 35 every time. Set your watch by us. Sometimes we surprise the other with a news story. But this week, we actually have a news story that dropped just as I was leaving radio contact for a couple of weeks. And so we're going to dip back into what I thought was a pretty big whiskey story. Yeah, I receiving this PR piece, I was, I was almost upset that it came when it came because it was just as you were leaving and you're shutting off your phones. And this is something, if I'm being honest, should have been recorded when it when it came and before all everybody knew all the news but here we are jason i can't i can't blame you for wanting to enjoy a little vacay <laughs> well if history has taught me anything it's that people won't really formulate their opinions until the heroes riff on this uh, you know, so yeah. so the whiskey world can formulate final conclusions as we run through today's Extra Extra. You, Josh, are in charge of reading it, so why don't you spoil us? Oh, and again, we don't do PR PCs, and this will now be the second one this season. That's a really good point. We make a point of not doing PR pieces. And we do we make a point of it, and now <laughs> we've done two. It's, these are, and they're both very, very short, and they only yeah. come to us from very close friends. So. Yeah. PR companies, don't get excited. Don't start sending in your press releases. Just keep it under wraps. Send it to the newspaper and then we'll read it from the newspaper. <laughs> so this came to us from our friends at Elixir Distillers. You all may remember Elixir Distillers. We had Oliver Chilton on here at least once. And uh, Chris on Mabin. On One Nation Under Whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Jason. On One Nation Under Whiskey. We've had Chris Mabin. On One Nation Under we Whiskey, have. we've had Chanel Lacory on uh, Movies, Mates, and Malts, right? <laughs> Triple M, as I like to call it. Triple M. And, uh, and they're all part of Elixir Distillers, owners of Black Dot Rum and Port Eskeg and uh, Single Malts of Scotland, Elements of Isla, and now the owners of a shiny new distillery. So the headline of the PR piece. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off the hook that, that easily. I'm glad I could go Whiskey away trail. for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 okay. no. Port Natruin. <laughs> the distillery yeah. that they're currently building. Oh, yeah. I, there's no doubt about that. However, that is older news. They've only just started, <laughs> uh, you know, they've broken ground. They're building. I, I, I think that's older news. I didn't, I didn't feel as if I we had only to. We only just covered the new name three or so episodes ago. Because I was still in Scotland when we covered the new name being released my for Portnatron. My point is, Jason, I have a PR piece that I need to get to. I'm ready to hear it. <laughs> so, the, the headline is, Elixir Distillers to Buy Tormor Distillery from Perno Ricard. Independent whiskey specialists... Elixir Distiller has today signed an agreement to buy the Tormor Distillery and brand from Perno Ricard. The acquisition hmm. is the latest move from the co-founders and owners Rajbir and Sukinder Singh to develop Elixir Distillers into a world-leading brand owner, distiller, and independent bottler. Uh, note the lack of uh, use of uh, an Oxford comma there. Distiller and independent bottler are together. I wonder if that's purposeful. Anyway, 
It goes on. Sikinder Singh explained, quote, Tormor is one of the most visually stunning distilleries in Speyside. He's not wrong. Some people would say he that's opinion. Wrong. That's fact. That's fact. Remember, we're not meant to be riffing in the reading section. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> that was a calm down to Murray. Calm down, Murray. Calm down. <laughs> oh, that's right. It produces a beautiful spirit and fits in perfectly with Elixir Distiller's flavor first philosophy to bottle only the very highest quality whiskeys. We are I hope they spell philosophy with an F there and put it on t-shirts. Oh, flavor left. first philosophy. Oh man. <laughs> we are hoping to build on the work that's been done by Perno Ricard to bring to life the magic of Tormor and to show consumers around the world just what a hidden gem it is. We are humbled to be the new custodians of Tormor. We couldn't have asked for a better distillery to welcome to the Elixir family alongside our new Isla distillery, Port Natruin. There you go. I see that they put their new one. You should be saying the old news Isla distillery, Port Natruin. <laughs> My point is, I knew Sikinder would say the words for me, and I didn't want to take the words from Sikinder's mouth. Nobody believes you read that press release before this moment. Nobody believes that. <laughs> Tormor Distillery was built in 1960, designed by renowned architect and president of the Royal Academy, Sir Albert Richardson, whose style hmm. combined neoclassicism and modernism. Historical classicism. Classicism? 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 Classicism. Classicism. Neologism. Circumcision? Muzzle! (laughs) Historically known as, quote, the pearl of Speyside, the beauty and uniqueness of its architectural design were recognized in 1986 when the distillery was granted listed building status. It's oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know it was a listed building. Oh, huh. be- well, like it makes sense, but... Oh. Uh, I was going to say something. I'm, I'm retracting it. But, but it does make sense. <laughs> it's one of the first distilleries you encounter when you travel north to Speyside, and it is located close to Cragamore, Ballandalach, and Glenfarclas distilleries. And I'm going to return to my comment about the Oxford comma. There was no Oxford comma used here. I, I think it's just a, uh, a, a, ch- a grammatical choice. So I'm going to continue. Glad Tor- we cleared that up. <laughs> <laughs> Tormor Distillery has been owned by Perno Ricard since 2005. It is among one of the larger distilleries in Scotland with a capacity of just under 5 million liters of alcohol per year providing the potential for long-term growth. The deal with Elixir Distillers includes inventory of age stock. Alexander Ricard, chairman and CEO of Perno Ricard, stated, quote, Active portfolio management is an integral part of our long-term strategy. The sale of the Tormor brand and distillery follows the recent announcement of our investment behind the Aberlauer and Milton Duff distilleries. There you go. Ah, there you which go. we covered on Extra yep, Extra. Yep. Uh, which will increase our Scotch whiskey capacities by 14 million liters of alcohol per annum. So that's interesting. Offload a distillery that gives you 5 million, but increase by 19 million, right? Because you have to make up for that difference to to get to the extra 14 million liters of, of pure alcohol. That's interesting. We are delighted to be handle, we are delighted to be handing Tormor over to Sikinder and Rajbir, two friends and truly creative entrepreneurs, and look forward to finding new ways to collaborate in the future. That's the end of uh, Alexander's quote. The um, the PR piece continues and, and this is the final um, paragraph here. Sikinder and Rajbir foresee a bright future for Tormor. Quote, we're committed to creating a new era for Tormor. 
Our goal is to establish the reputation of Tormor on the global stage to match the special quality of the whiskey. We want Tormor to stand shoulder to shoulder alongside the biggest names in single malt whiskey, and we plan to release a brand range that Scotland will be proud of. We want to make this a real destination for all visitors to Speyside. We will be refurbishing the distillery, and we will also plan to build a visitor center. <laughs> so I wanted to put that in, in front of our listeners, but because this was a slightly shorter piece, I just wanted to pop in here a little bit of history that came from scotchwhiskey.com. If you'll, if you'll amuse me, Jason, if you'll indulge I will, me. I, I will say. indulge you this time. Thank you. So do not make a habit of it. <laughs> So if you go to scotchwhiskey.com, which unfortunately is no longer updated, but I would argue is one of the best resources online uh, when when it comes to the history of distilleries and and, and ownership and just a lot of ins and outs uh, of the scotch whiskey industry. So a little bit of Tormor history. Construction began in 1959, according to scotchwhiskey.com, and Tormor began to distill in 1961. Um, again, it's the design of Sir Albert Richardson, then president of the Royal Academy. At that time, Tormor was a part of Long John Distillers, and its make was used mostly in the firm's eponymous blends that were major sellers in North America. It is now one of the malts used in Ballantines, an association <laughs> uh, which dates back to when the Long John Stable was bought by Allied Distillers in 1989. Tormor and Ballantines is now a part of Chivas Brothers, uh, which is Perno Ricard, basically. Mm-hmm. So just really quickly here, I, I, re- I really like the way Scotch Whiskey does this sort of timeline here, right? So it says, 1959, Shenley International, owner of Long John, begins construction of Tormor. 1961, distillation begins at Tormor. 1972, Tormor stills are extended from four to eight. 1975, Mm. Long John and its distilleries are sold to brewer Whitbread. Didn't we? Oh, who used to own Glen Oogie, right? Uh, In 1989, (laughs) Allied Distillers, (laughs) later Allied Demek, purchases the spirits division of Whitbread, including Tormor. In 2004, Tormer 12-year-old is released. Now, just to be clear there, it was only released for the French market. Wow. Yeah. In 2005, Pernod Ricard takes over the distillery following its acquisition of Allied Demec. In 2014, Tormer completes installation of shared gas pipe with the Glenlivet, Cragenmore, and Tomantol. And in 2014, in the same year, Tormer 12-year-old is replaced by 14 and 16-year-old bottlings. And again, that's, that was just for the French market. I, you know, We spoke quickly with Ali about that, and, and he let us know that that was just for the French market. And finally, I, I want to go over, because I imagine there's a lot of people here who may not be familiar with Tormor, because yes, it's five million liters capacity, but almost <laughs> all of it, you know, just like Glen Allocky, which is 4 million liters of spirit, it was all for blends, right? So I just want to go through some of the facts here. So capacity, 5 million liters of pure alcohol. Fermentation time, 52 hours. Malt specification, unpeated. And Jason, I know you were talking about um, – uh, Michael Jackson saying he had tasted some earlier, a five-year-old and a 10-year-old Tormor. He talked about a smokiness, but this says that it's uh, an unpeated um, barley here. The wash, yep. still shape, traditional pot, coal-fired shape into an oggy and flanged head with purifier. The wash <laughs> bats are stainless steel. The water source is achvochi. Burn, sorry, any uh, native Gaelic speakers there. Yeast type, Maori cream. Man, it goes on. Um, 
but you know what? Here, I, I, I'm going I'm, – I will mention this, right? They've got 11 washbacks, and they talk about – this, I think, is a really cool sort of statistic. They talk about warped clarity. And we, mm-hmm. we've, we've spoken with a lot of producers that like to uh, delineate their their clarity. You know, if you have a cloudy wart, you're going to get a nuttier style of whiskey. If you have a clear wart – you get a fruitier style of whiskey and having tasted our fair share of Toromores and having bottled our own, it makes sense that the wort clarity is clear. It's a fruitier style Mm -hmm. of whiskey. So, so there you go. That is the ins and outs of Toromore distillery. Well, and I think, I think with these details added to the record, Mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to go forth and see what elixir distillers do to fermentation times, right? The rate at which it moves through the spirit safe, the barley used, the quality of casks used. This this feels like a line in the sand from current ownership to new ownership. Well, I have some thoughts and I have some ideas and and I want to share some of these thoughts and ideas with you but but i know we got a complaint from your brother murray that said stop riffing in the front part so what do we do here jason let's take a break we'll come back in a second that first half we were mentioning Michael Jackson and as always I've got the 1989 edition of his uh, whiskey, his malt whiskey companion in my hands and so you you talked about a statement of fact earlier it's reiterated here by by Michael Jackson. Tormor architecturally the most elegant of all malt distilleries Mm -hmm. He, he does go on actually later, a couple of paragraphs later, to talk about Tormor was erected in 1958. So no one has the date right. We've got 58 floating around, we've got 59 <laughs> floating around, we've got 60 floating around, we've got Spirit Ran in 61. <laughs> we're, we're certainly in a, in a key period there. But he does add in, it was the first completely new malt distillery to be built in the Highlands in the 20th century. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's very... Right, because most of these other distilleries, like the big build-outs were 1897. And then you had the Patterson crash around the, the turn of the century, right? right? So... Right. Then, then if you chart yeah. build dates, you get dates in the 1960s, some dates in the 1970s. But here we are, if you go with this... 58 to 61 there was there was really nobody building um fully or completely new in that exact period and during that time there in the highlands in the hi- yeah but during that time i think the space <laughs> i think that space side was still considered highlands right so you couldn't you had glen Allocky that was built in 67 so e- even if you know regardless that that was uh almost a decade later so Anyway. Yeah, the, the thing I was checking on the map there is, as we've talked about it multiple times and just mentioned it actually quite recently in Travelling North with Jess, where I always think Tormor is closer to the A9 than it is. It is still the first mm-hmm. you meet when you leave yeah, that, that A9 corner. at Granton mm-hmm. on Spey, right? What I then follow up forget is that once you hit Tormor, you're just a couple of bends and you're at Craggenmore, then Ballandalloc, then up and round the hill and over a bit. And you've got Knockdo over on that side of the burn. You've got Glen Farkless over here on the right side mm-hmm. of the road. Mm-hmm. Like it really, as soon as you hit Tormor, it really starts taking off for distillery visits. But there's really nothing before you hit Tormor. Although now that I've said that, right. the new Gordon McPhail distillery is much closer to the A9. And and Jess and I passed that site. Ah, 
that's interesting. So they, they can no longer it's, stake the claim of like I exactly. I always felt as if Tormor was like was welcome to space side and you see that gorgeous building which which in my mind always yep. felt like I mean, granted from a visual perspective, it didn't feel this way, but you know, it, it was like the Wonka factory, right? Where you pass by and it's yeah, yeah, gorgeous yeah. and you wonder what is it? If it's this beautiful on the outside, what must it look like <laughs> on the inside? And without a visitor center and without knowing somebody on the inside at uh, Shivas or, or Peno Ricard, we've, we've never been inside it. There you go. Knock, knock, knocking on Oliver Chilton's door. Wow. Hi, <laughs> hi, hi, hi. <laughs> it, it was fun, though. And, and I know you, you and I have said it before. And I think I've, I've probably said it with everybody I've, I've driven by it with. And the latest with driving by it with Jess, which is how does that not have a visitor center? How can it be in 2022? You can't go for a tour around Tormor. I- at the same yeah. time, there's no brand around Tormor. There's no single malt range around Tormor. Yeah. Like I, I, sometimes I think these whiskey companies wonder who would come and visit. Right? If if we're not putting in the brand work, mm-hmm. no one's going to come here from France. No one's going to come here from Brazil or America or or anywhere else. And it's just not true. You would absolutely, especially when you're the first distillery you pass yeah. coming off the yeah. A9 on your way towards Speyside, you would stop. You'd go, oh, look at that building. I oh, have to go and have a wee look at that. I think given the 21st century's sensibilities, and, and more specifically, right, the 2010s, the 2020s sensibilities, of course, we stand there thinking, yeah, why, why wouldn't you? But think about when it was built, right? The the, the very mm-hmm. late fifties, the very early sixties, single malt whiskey wasn't even a marketed oh, no. thing. There no. were no single malt no, brands, no, no. No. period. And and no. even when they became a thing, whiskey tourism wasn't really a thing for for many years, for many decades. I mean, some distilleries here and there, but by and large. It wasn't, and your point about their liquid being primarily used for blends, right? The, the brand was Ballantines. The brand was whatever you know, Long John blend it happened to go to, and and you just like saying Long John. Well, I'm trying so desperately to to not say Long John Silver, um, and so. <laughs> well, good job. You, you haven't said it yet, so you're doing fantastic. <laughs> So, so it makes, Kudos to you. it makes sense, but this is, you know, here we are now in the 2020s and, and I loved reading uh, that they're, they're going to build out a visitor center. I, I, I can't wait. I do wonder if it's going to change the, the outer facade or if they're going to adjust um, the, you know, the, the, the inside of it. Right. I do wonder where they would put, the visitor center because you know not having been in the distillery you don't know where it could be, you know if there's space already to put it or if right behind the windows well then my question for the site and, and again yeah we, we don't know the site we don't know what it entails but when you see those cottages that were former workers cottages mm. it'll be curious to see if any of those are still attached to the distillery ownership yeah. or or whether they're all in private hands because I feel like what Glenn Murray have done with the the distillery manager's house mm-hmm. on site where it's now this beautiful lab and tasting room and lounge with upstairs offices like you, you couldn't necessarily turn it into a visitor centre mm-hmm. but the way a lecture already talking about treating Tormor. Yeah. Sounds like you would want a place to take some VIPs, some privileged uh, guests, okay. and yeah. and kind of let them run through the spirit and the maturation and, and all of that. Yeah. And so if more of those cottages are available, that could potentially offer up 
a way to to still connect to the history, but introduce a visitor centre. If those are privately owned, well, do you start knocking on doors and making offers that people can't refuse? Yeah. And I and I mean that in a monetary sense, not in a godfather sense. You would mention that's funny. Nice cottage you've got here. <laughs> it would be a shame if it burned to the ground overnight. <laughs> oh, hi, nice cottage. <laughs> So you had said something I thought was quite interesting. Where you said, "Sounds like me." Ooh, I, said I, I. I wonder, and this was you know while I was reading all of the ins and outs, right? The the fermentation <laughs> times and, and and all this. It it certainly gave me time to think. I can tell you that much. There was a lot of ins and outs, Jason. <laughs> and what have yous? And what have yous? What fours? You had said. I wonder, you know, if they're going to change fermentation times and, and you know, adjust mm. this, mm-hmm. adjust that. So here's, here's something that struck me reading back the PR piece where it was either Raj Beer or Sikendra. I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but they referred to themselves as custodians of Tormor, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And in my Right, they they have a choice to make here. They could take the Glenallachy route that uh, Billy Walker took, where he he bought this distillery that had four million liters of spirit capacity, and truncated that down to six hundred thousand yeah. liters of capacity. And he, where he <laughs> said, "You know what? No more with the blenders contracts. I'm not going to sell this spirit to anyone. I'm only going to produce single malt." And then his his fermentation times went to you know. 60 to 72 hours up to 163 hours and in some cases 360 some odd hours but if elixir distillers purchase this not just to create a single malt range which will take them years to do right Mm -hmm. it makes sense for them to to look at selling off spirit as an opportunity to make funds for various other projects, right? Perhaps to build a visitor center, uh, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, so it'll be interesting to see if they do that. My my thought is they're probably going to continue tour more in the manner that it was, keep producing the five five million liters of spirit. That's the question that I've got: is does Tormore have a capacity of five million? that it's maybe not even producing two right now. Mm-hmm. And so we, so we perhaps don't know the amount of Tormor that's being produced to fulfill those blending contracts. My guess would be, given that they're fulfilling blending contracts, it is counted in the millions. And I'm, and I'm sure they're closer to five than they are to, say, one or two uh, million. Yeah. So, so, yeah, and I think at that point, you know, once they once they take ownership of this, I don't think you change everything when you walk in the front door. I think you get a sense of what you're doing, what does that look like internally, and where might you want to tweak. Yeah. And and then you know they they talk about the stocks being moved. How old are the stocks? You know, it, you know if they wanted to come out with a range that was twenty five, eighteen, and twelve. Do they have the stocks for that? You know, are they going to be bringing in a whole bunch of stocks that are 12 years old at a maximum, eight years old at a maximum Mm -hmm. with some older stuff dotted around? So, you know, on one hand, Tormor has been sold and Elixir own it. Fly the flags. What the hell does any of that mean Mm. for the next 12 months, two years, 10 years of elixir operations, yeah. no idea, but we know the people we can speak to. We know the people we can talk to for One Nation under whiskey to get some of these questions answered, if not simply, well, we don't know that right now, and we don't know that right now, and we don't know that right now. So maybe we'll give them some time to get their feet under the table before we start hitting them with questions. But I would love to have a conversation about Tormor. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. I, I think I think the next step is doing exactly what you said, right? Let them get their feet on the ground 
And then we bring them on to One Nation Under Whiskey and have a conversation about what they're looking to do. My understanding is they don't actually take ownership of like actual ownership until sometime in September. And so once they have the keys to the distillery, they take stock of their stock, <laughs> right? Literally, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, and to, and to figure out what the flavor profile is. I, I know we have just a few a few more minutes here if we want to adhere to our, our, our Type 35, which of which... Always. You know, but Always. But, you know, you and I having tasted Tormors from likely the 70s through to the 90s with, I think you and I may have tasted more 80s Tormor than we have any other Tormor. At least that's, that's my, mm-hmm. in my personal experience. I have noted that each decade Tormor seemed to have some sort of a change, right? If I, if I think about all of the 80s Tormor that we've had before, it's had this massive spicy component to it. If I think about the seventies, yeah, big pepper, yeah, right, huge pepper to it, yeah, yeah, exactly. That building pepper on the finish. The seventies Tormor has had sort of this more richer, fruitier style, and then the Tormor that mm. we bottled, which was a nineties, I want to say it was ninety eight, ninety nine, something like that, maybe ninety seven. Mm. Um, it was. I have it right beside. Oh, me. do you? Oh, nice. Um, you know that one was was soft. 96. 96. There you go. Right. That that one was soft and with sort of delicate orchard fruits. What is our what is our tasting note say on the bottle there? I was just reading that as you were waxing lyrical or and and I gave you major kudos because it starts out delicate and then it says uh, both delicate and spicy at the same time. It's a classic Tormor in terms of its pepper profile, but the lemon thread that runs through Ooh. it is a new wrinkle. On a traditional theme, only a hundred and fifty-six bottles yeah, that, that from was, a second fill bourbon barrel. That was a short path. That was, yeah, thirsty. But you, thirsty angels. But you and I had samples of a twelve-year-old single cask and a sixteen-year-old single cask, and I think back to that twelve-year, which I thought was better than the sixteen-year. And by the way, that twelve-year was was bottled somewhat recently. And I think back to the flavor profile of that, and it was this wonderful mix of, of, of apple, like yellow apple, dark chocolate, right? There was a bit of salinity to it, um, a touch of spice across, the, you know, you know, as the finish comes about. Like, like it had such a wonderful profile to it. And it was first filled bourbon, yet we still got that dark chocolate component, which just floored me. I really, really enjoyed it. I was sipping on our Tormor 21. Yeah, I watched it. <laughs> By sipping, I saw you pull from the bottle. Straight from the bottle. Uh, while you were talking there, it is very, very tasty. Am I right in saying it was a California retail exclusive? That was an exclusive to our distributor in California. That was a JVS exclusive. No, it's it's cracking. Yeah, it's yeah. really cracking. It's really bright and fruity, like some of these directions we've been seeing Tormor go. Yeah. But it's still got a heft to yeah, it. Yeah, that. I really love that heft in the spirit. That one, and I appreciate you bringing up the JVS exclusive of it. I remember you and I talking about that cask. It was bottled in uh, 2017, right? Yep. Yeah. So 2017 is when we launched our retail range. And that mm. cask as an exclusive to JVS was a thank you to our good friend Sam Filmus, who'd been supporting Single Cast Nation since the very beginning. And we wanted to Indeed. give him his own exclusive California release. And uh, and it was that Tormor. You and I could spend more time waxing lyrical about Tormor. And we will certainly return to it in One Nation Under Whiskey. But for the moment, I just want to extend sincere congratulations to, to Raj Beer and Sukinder mm-hmm. for securing this distillery, which in this day and age of established distilleries moving from conglomerate to conglomerate, mm-hmm. to see two chaps secure this deal 
is really wonderful. And I think it's a really good look for the industry. And so kudos to them for pulling it off, for partnering it with Portna Truin and, and obviously all the other projects that they've got under that banner. And uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to speak to them in the future about this whole endeavour. I'm excited to visit the distillery. <laughs> and taste some new make running from the stills. Man, I'm going to it. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here, Joshua. Thanks to you. Thanks to Elixir for sending in the PR piece. PR companies, don't get excited. And thanks, as always, to our dear listeners for coming along with us on the ride. Go forth, formulate your own opinions on the sale of Tormor. If you want to email us your conclusions, you can get us at questions at one nation under whiskey.com, no Ian Whiskey, or info at singlecastnation.com. And we would love to hear your thoughts on the sale of Tormor. And on that note, we're going to get out of here. Cheers, all. Cheers, dear listeners. Cheers, Joshua. Cheers, Jason. Peace. Peace.